has had such a tremendous impact on the nation and particularly young black coaches of this country that it is almost synonymous with Jackie Robinson. I'm sure the opportunity for me to be a head football coach started in 1979 when Willie Jeffers broke the color barrier. There could not have been a better man to be selected for the person to break that color barrier. Prior to 1978, there had never been a black head coach in all of Division I-A college football. The NFL hadn't had a black coach since Fritz Pollard in the mid-1920s. The stigma was the residue of prejudice that an African-American somehow couldn't leave. 1979 was a time that most athletic departments, most front offices weren't even thinking of black head football coaches, weren't thinking of general managers, weren't thinking of anybody really in a position of authority. Black coaches were absolutely unheard of to even suggest that a black individual be an athletic director or an associate athletic director was laughable. It's mind-boggling that you still didn't have a black head coach at a major university. And the reason I'm saying that is because they had such a preponderance of black players on the team. There were some teams that were like closed shop. I mean, no matter what your credentials were, you weren't going to get the job if you were non-white. The black coach automatically became the assistant coach, regardless as to his record, his philosophy of life, whatever. Before Willie Jeffries, Wichita State had gone through seven head coaches in 15 years, but had only one winning season to show for it. Desperate for someone to recruit more African-American athletes to the plains of Kansas, the school was willing to break an invisible barrier. We had our struggles, no question about it, and at times it became very difficult to sell college football. What Ted Bradyhoff wanted more than anything was a winner. He was Barnum. Bailey and Ringling Brothers all rolled into one. He thought it would bring some publicity to the university. But at the same time, he wanted a good football coach. I don't think he wanted tokenism. Their program at the time wasn't doing very well, so why not take a chance on a guy who's been unbelievably successful at this level? The other people involved would probably say, oh, race didn't play a part. That's garbage. Certainly it did as far as I'm concerned. I, I know it did. A lot of people were apprehensive about you know, can a black coach coach at this level? One of the reasons given for not hiring head football coaches is they can't raise money with white alumni, can't lead white players on the teams. Anything of controversy that entered that equation was going to be used as an excuse to get rid of them. If you didn't win, they would say, oh, well, we told you so. Black coach can't win. A black coach can't handle this program. This is too big a program. Wichita State wanted him so that they could recruit fast black players from the East Coast. I think I asked specifically, you know, what part is race going to play in your recruitment process? <laughs> and he kind of looked and smiled and he said, Dr. Rogers, I don't believe race is going to play a part in my recruiting process at all. Jeffries had turned his alma mater, South Carolina State, into a powerhouse, capturing a black national championship in 1976 and producing a 50-13-4 record in six seasons. He had to choose whether to remain in his comfort zone or become a highly controversial symbol. Really did not want to leave his alma mater because he loved this institution, but he wanted to go because he was getting ready to make history. I'm sure Jeff at his dream, but they never included being the first coach. I mean, because you had nothing to, to cause that dream. I said, well, if you ever want to move up in the coaching ranks, I should take this. And I think it might open the doors for other African-American coaches, even if I just hold my ground. A lot of our hopes were riding on Coach Jeff because we thought he could help level out the playing field. I would like to give my purpose for being here in Shaka country. It's to build and develop a winning football team. The impact of his hiring opened up doors because it let coaches know that a barrier has been broken and usually first give hope for more in the future. He led the way. A lot of coaches really took note and it really gave so many minority coaches hope. But not everyone embraced the notion of an African-American coach, no matter how glittering his credentials. 
Wichita State tiptoed its way through this minefield. He was in the spotlight, certainly from the community, a conservative community, a community waiting for a black head football coach to make a mistake. We knew the athletic director and the committee that selected him, they were interested and they were staying with him, but he didn't know about the faculty or the fans or the, the Wichita community. We got a hold of a Wichita State guide, and if you look at the way he is presented in that guide, he's referred to as Jeff Jeffries. Not Willie Jeffries, but Jeff Jeffries. Now, a lot of people refer to him as Jeff. It's just a nickname. But it was almost as if Wichita State was trying to get people, hey, this guy's not really black. A person associated with the Shocker athletic program explained it to me. They said, well, the Shocker athletic officials think that Willie is just a little too black, so Jeff would be a more acceptable nickname for him. Jeffries and his family also faced more direct forms of racism, which included the loss of at least one recruit. He barely was honest about it. He said, I can't play for you because you're black and I just don't want to play for you. Jeffries' reaction was he was happy to find that out now instead of on fourth and one. It was rough. The first year, we had a lot of nasty phone calls, N-word phone calls, stupid N-word, whatever, you know, you shouldn't be here. Some of the things that, that people say, I think it's mean, cool. But I've always taken up for him. I've had a couple of serious altercations in the stands. I went to Coach Jeffrey, and every time I went in there to crown his shoulder, he ended up crowning my shoulder because of all the things he's having to endure as a head coach who just happens to have been black. I'm sure that there were some times when he may have felt, what am I doing here? What can I do at Wichita State that's going to change people's minds about whether African American could be a head coach or what, school or not? Others are watching. Others' futures are dependent upon what you do or you don't do. I think he knew that. He was willing to take that chance, not just for himself, but I think he understood he was carrying a heavier load on his shoulders, and he carried it. We had overt, visible uh, discrimination and segregation in the South. Born in January of 1937 to John and Irene in Tiny Union, South Carolina, Willie Jeffries learned early on about skin color and the volatile reaction it could generate. It forged in him a resolve that would sustain him through times of turbulence. My dad died when I was four, so I started caddying at the Union Country Club at a very young age. I think that helped me immensely uh, in dealing with people. Willie didn't have time to worry about the politics of the things that was happening during that era. As we got older, you know, I got into college, then those kind of things started concerning us. At State College, during the time that Jeff and all of us there, we were involved in the lunch counter protest. That was a white and black thing. That shifted this country. It kept men like Jeffrey determined to strive to make a difference and strive to do it in a way that would bring a healing to our community. It was in this tumultuous atmosphere in the spring of 1961 that Jeffries took his first head coaching job at Grenard High, the all-black high school in Gaffney, South Carolina. We had to use the hand-me-down equipment from Gaffney High School, and we were happy to have it because it was new to us, and it was better than what we were using before. When the team was becoming famous, they allowed us to play over at the White High School. At halftime, we were not allowed to go into the dressing rooms. If we had to go to the bathroom, we had to form a circle, and the person would have to go to the bathroom there in full view of the people in the stands. Despite the squalid conditions, Jeffries won three consecutive state championships in his seven-year tenure at Grenard. Because of the success that he was enjoying, his name became a household word. I remember when we were integrating the schools, one of the things that was the strong point was having that kind of leadership uh, being exerted by men like, of course, Jeffries in particular. Jeffries moved up to the college ranks in 1968, becoming an assistant at North Carolina A&T. Four years later, he joined the staff of Pitt and mined pure recruiting gold, including future Heisman Trophy winner Tony Dorsett. He's one of the main factors of recruiting a group of freshmen 
who ended up winning the national championship as seniors four years after that. It was the last year that the number of recruits was unlimited. We signed, I believe, 73 players that year. Tony Dorsett was the main one that I recruited. We knew we had a gym. With the chance to become a head coach, Jeffries left Pitt in 1973 for his alma mater. South Carolina State got two men for the price of one, the gentle whisperer and the screaming despot. Come here, do you, you want you being disrespecting me, boy? There are two Willie Jeffries. What are you looking at? He's like Dr. Jeff and Mr. Hyde before the game, during the game, and after the game. Why is he all back like this rather than down? Leading up to a game, uh, you have a soft-spoken man uh, who is humble in every way. After last year's record, it'll be a privilege to me to go anywhere, get invited anywhere. On game day now, he's a very, very intense person. Who was it? Hey, who? Hey! Playing at South Carolina State and also under Coach Jeffries, it was sort of like boot camp. We started Monday morning at 5.30. We practice every day for 60 minutes of football. First day of spring practice, we worked so hard, at least a third of that team quit. I just learned real early that when it's your time to go through the sled, you do it right the first time, because if not, he's going to make you go back and do it again. We had to be on the field at 6 o'clock in the morning when the stars were still out and everybody else was sleeping. I wanted to see a lot of times if and who he could break. And every day he was like, no quit. And I wanted to quit, but I was like, nah, I ain't gonna quit, I ain't gonna quit. Had I not gone through the things, the experiences that I went through at South Carolina State, I don't know if I would have made it uh, my first year with the Giants. Good job, good job, guys. Good job, just go forward and catch it. You be all right? I refer to him as uh, my father and father figure and a mentor to me. Losing a father at an early age and knowing what I would have wanted, it probably carried over into my personality as to how I, I wanted to see other young men grow up because I'll say 70, 75 percent of all of the players I've had in high school and college don't have a dad at home. Jeffries was a tactical innovator running an offense of deception and guile called the freeze option. Willie is considered the father of the freeze and what it is is basically a zero dive with a trap and then it's a whole option that comes off of that. It's part of the legacy of football, kind of like the West Coast offense or Buddy Ryan's 46 defense. People then build off that and take parts of it and put it into what they do and I think that will be part of his legacy. And not many are called, but those who get called must answer. And if you answer, you got to perform. Willie Jeffries brought two of his assistants with them to Wichita State for the 1979 season. One, Ben Blacknall was defensive coordinator. There was tension. Quite frankly, you had white coaches taking orders from a black coach, which was, I'm sure, a little different for them. I thought we were pioneers, but I kind of enjoyed it because I thought we were going to get a chance to show people that Afro-Americans could really be successful at the Division I level. The Shockers were 1-10 and 10 in Jeffrey's inaugural season. As tough as the games were, landing the talent was even more daunting. I think the most difficult thing I had at Wichita was recruiting good athletes to the plains of Kansas. He could go to a kid and he would really think this kid was going to commit to come to his school, but when Bear Bryant came behind him, he would lose that kid oftentimes. Jeffries persisted and by his fourth season had transformed a perennial loser into a winner. Wichita State went 8-3 in 1982, prompting Army and Michigan State to contact Jeffries about becoming their head coach. The springboard for all that success was the Shockers' second game of the season against much bigger Kansas. We're the four kids on the, the side of the tracks and KU's up there on the hill, um, being blue-blooded and snobbish and looking down on us. Uh, and we, we whooped them in football. We beat the University of Kansas. I think the first time we saw State beat them in, in 25 or 30 years. 
The only game I've ever cried over was the game against KU. We had some billboards donated throughout the metropolitan area here. The copy for the billboard was nothing but four numbers, 13 to 10. It was a great victory for the city of Wichita and for Wichita State, but more than that, I might think it might have been a great victory for black head coaches. In the midst of Wichita State's resurgence, Jeffries and two members of his coaching staff violated a number of NCAA rules during the recruitment of wide receiver Tex Allen. The violations included making improper contact with Allen at his home in Dallas, transporting him to Wichita and paying for a meal along the way. They brought the kid back to Wichita and when they arrived in Wichita, the NCAA, uh, an NCAA investigator was waiting for them on the campus. Coach Jeffries gave the recruit money for transportation home and that he phoned the recruit's parents and asked them to lie about the trip. Because the school's basketball program had been punished previously by the NCAA, the penalty for the football team was more severe than normal. Two years probation, no bowl games, and the loss of 10 scholarships. When you have trouble in your program, when you have violations that are clear violations, picky you or not, the buck stops at the head coach. Whether Willie knew about them or not, it's still his responsibility to run a clean program. Knowing you're under a microscope and to have this happen, that was really a tough blow to me in my coaching profession. A huge disappointment to me and I think to all of our black coaches. After the NCAA sanctions took effect, recruiting became more difficult. According to the Wichita State Athletic Department, the number of black players fell from 43 to 33 during Jeffrey's first four years as head coach. Yet the perception still persisted that the program was overloaded with black players. Being a black head coach in that 1A setting at a historically white school where they just felt that, that there were too many black players out there and we were losing games. And one guy said, what are we now, the Gremlin of the Plains? He may have worked extra hard to recruit white athletes to dispel the idea that Wichita State was going to become the grambling of the Plains. A year after Wichita State was put on NCAA probation, the Shockers fell to 3-8. and eight. After the season, Jeffries resigned and accepted the head coaching job at another historically black college, Howard University. He probably knew that he had to go. <laughs> um, whether somebody said you have to go and take the next available job, I, I just don't know that. His troubles with the NCAA cost him his job. Within a few years after Willie left, the football program was killed by the university president. If Willie Jeffries had not left or been forced to resign, Wichita State might still have a Division I football program. In just three years, Jeffries transformed Howard University into a winner before leaving in 1988. But in 1991, the NCAA placed Howard on probation for violations that occurred while Jeffries was coach. For Jeffries, his college head coaching career would end where it began at South Carolina State. Let's play hard. You know your assignments. Let's go out and win. It has to be in your mind that you're going to win the game when you hit the field. Jeff has been a real ambassador for the state of South Carolina because I don't know if anybody has been a bigger builder of young men and I think the fact that South Carolina State, even today, has one of the best reputations for graduating its athlete is a testament to the kind of culture that Jeff instilled. Proving that you can go home again, Willie Jeffries returned to South Carolina State in 1989. Some stirring triumphs followed, including one over the Grambling legend Eddie Robinson in the 1994 Heritage Bowl, giving Jeffries a second black national championship. The two had a fierce rivalry. He's probably always been in the shadows of Eddie Robinson because of, you know, what Gremlin did and the notoriety that Eddie Robinson uh, obtained. One of the games I remember, Eddie Robinson and Coach Jeffries kind of bumped in each other. A good fight almost started. The C2 head coaches, I mean, these guys are, are the epitome of, of black college football. And they stand up there, man, they ready to go to war with each other. I got a little bit upset, and I think Coach Rob might have been preoccupied. We had some tough words, we certainly did. You know, he's Eddie Robinson, he's a great coach, but he's not going to treat our coach like that. You know, that, that, was, that was kind of what the kids were saying. We've been friends all over the years, but that particular night, it got a little bit out of hand.
on November 24, 2001, Jeffries coached his last game. Good afternoon, sports fans, and welcome to South Carolina State football. For today's historic occasion, South Carolina State honors its coach, Willie Jeffries. He's definitely going to leave some very, very large shoes to fill. And I think that we're going to measure our future coaches by the standards that Coach Jeffries set. You all knew how it was going when we were one and five. It was really tough. If I had gone out a one and nine, or uh, even three and eight or something of that nature, it just, I never could have rested. I really, really appreciate this effort. This is yours, game ball. Thank you. Thank you. The 16-10 victory over Norfolk State brought Jeffrey's college coaching record to 170, 140, and 6. But his contributions are the kind that can't be measured in numbers. Oftentimes you can count all of your true friends on one hand. Well, Coach Jeffries is my thumb, and that's the most important part of friendship. Think of the number of players over the years that he's touched their life. And if you meet him, he's going to touch your life. Some about him is going to rub off on you. He was the first one that came from a predominantly black college to receive a coaching job at a predominantly white college. You really have to sit back and understand how much he means to our race. It gives hope to other African American coaches that if you're successful, you may get that opportunity to go coach at an upper major division one school People thought that this was going to open the doors, yet here we sit some two and a half decades later with only four African-American head coaches in Division 1A. Forty years is a long time since civil rights laws were passed, which supposedly accessibility to employment opportunities were supposed to be equally for all. Inside athletics, especially Division 1, there's still the glass ceiling, and I think that's unfortunate. We should probably be much further along the way than we are at this time. We've never had more than eight head black coaches in Division 1A, and now we have four. I think it's dismal, it's appalling, and they need to be corrected. Being the first at something is never easy, and, and he did that and did it well and did it with class. Who knows where we'd be if it weren't for Coach Jeffrey.